Chapter 6, The Riots That Shook the Nation. But don't let that completely mislead you. There were plenty of uprisings, protests, and you name it when Biden was declared the winner. Trump wasn't having it and proclaimed that this election is far from over. This came days after he used social media to tweet, stop the count as more ballots came in. There were protests across the country in major cities such as D.C. and Atlanta. But one tweet from Trump garnered particular attention. The former president was calling for a rally in D.C. a few days after the new year, asking his followers to be there and claiming that it will be wild. While it may not have been a surprise for Trump to call a rally, he held them with regularity even during COVID. Not many could have predicted the horror that would unfold. Events in Washington have taken a violent and tumultuous turn in the past few hours as thousands of supporters of President Trump stormed the U.S. Capitol building, venting their anger at the victory of Joe Biden in the presidential election. They forced the evacuation and lockdown of Congress itself, where lawmakers were all set to approve the election result. Shortly before the clashes, President Trump had addressed his supporters near the White House, telling them that he would never accept defeat. That was the BBC's report on a day that we will never forget. Not just the United States, nor just the UK, but everywhere around the world. Five people died within 36 hours of the insurrection, including a police officer, and 174 police officers were injured as well, among others. Four officers who responded to the attacks committed suicide within the next seven months. WAER's John Smith remembers watching them unfold three years ago, and he still speaks about them with severity. I remember watching it unfolding on TV, and, you know, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. And the, you know, pictures of even officers being assaulted or, you know, practically being crushed uh, at an entrance, um, you know, it was just, you know, this mass chaos that, that you were watching. Mass chaos indeed, especially if you were on site. Protesters storming the Capitol is clearly a world-shattering deal, and it happened during a global pandemic. That increases the scale precipitously. In the immediate days after the attacks, the United States experienced some of the deadliest days since 9-11 in history. Fortunately, some front and center journalists covering the story, like CBS News' Scott McFarlane, weren't exposed to the virus, at least at the U.S. Capitol. I actually was at home because of, because of the pandemic. They limited the number of bodies here at the Capitol. I mean, the halls were as empty as they are here. Um, they, had a, they didn't have a formal head count, but the news organizations didn't want to put a lot of people in here. It's a Petri dish. It's, it's, it's pre-vaccine for most people. All kinds of sick folks are walking around, and they didn't want to have a lot of people exposed. So I'm trying to chronicle all this and report out all this from home, which is hard, man. Because if you're not there, <laughs> you're missing a lot. Even if you're not reporting like you typically would be during non-pandemic times, how do you still tell a story accurately? McFarland's answer? Something several journalists used to a T, their connections. I was tapping into to, to some number of contacts, the ones who were the ones who were useful because they were actually, you know, seeing stuff or actually here. A lot of congressional staff weren't here either. They were working from home. Thank God for them. Um, but I remember getting good incremental updates through the peak of the violence and then recognizing that night that this was going to be a very long-term story because there are thousands of people who are part of a riotous mob. It's going to be a pretty big prosecution. I didn't realize it then, but it's the largest criminal prosecution in U.S. history, and we're still seeing people charged, including today. In addition to connections, social media also played a big role. Many journalists are especially reliant on Twitter, now X, a platform Trump got banned from in the wake of the January 6th attacks. He wasn't reinstated until Elon Musk purchased the platform a few years later. That was one of many lingering effects that stemmed from the insurrection. The story dominated headlines the next day, locally, nationally, and worldwide. You know, the format has done whenever there is, you know, a breaking news situation is that, you know, NPR is just like wall to wall coverage. And from what I remember, they they did, you know, nonstop coverage uh, where, you know, there were limited to no commercial breaks even. Um, and then eventually they might, you know, allow 
for local breaks and everything. So I think it pretty much, you know, replaced a lot of our news even. Um, so that just tells you that, you know, how bad a situation is when, you know, the network is, you know, canceling us and all the other member stations. Well, John Smith just told you about the coverage of the day after the attacks. Over three years later, it's still making significant headway. So there is breaking news now from the federal appeals court that has now ruled that former President Donald Trump does not have immunity. This in the January 6th matter that deals directly with the special prosecutor, uh, Jack Smith. The decision marks the second time in as many months the judges have turned away Trump. Democrats and dishonest people in the media every single day accuse President Trump of waging an insurrection and accuse many of us of waging an insurrection and you're doing nothing but lying and selling the lies of the Democrats all for campaigns and elections. Shame on every single person that has done that. Trump did not get presidential immunity in the January 6th case, and his ally, Georgia Senator Marjorie Taylor Greene, lashed out on the media for its coverage. This came over three years after the riots and nine months away from the 2024 presidential election. McFarlane realized that the attacks would have an impact on the 2024 race, but certainly not to this degree. I think I predicted this political impact, where those who were victimized in the Capitol would side, in some cases, would side with the rioters. They would side with Trump, which has defined everything about the presidential race ever since. As soon as the decision was made in the days, hour after January 6th, that the Republicans were going to get Trump's back on this and side with the rioters, it, it cast the die for how this whole presidential cycle has gone. It's important. Important indeed. The presidential race isn't the only thing that's still feeling the after effects of the insurrection. Hundreds of rioters have been accused or convicted. McFarland has noticed that defendants on trial, in the past and present, have a tendency to bring up COVID as an excuse while in court. I can't tell you how many January 6th cases I cover in the courts where the defendants, while asking for mercy, say they were, you know, they were coming off the trauma of COVID. You know, a lot of this was because they, their lives were changed by COVID and they just they sought refuge in political rhetoric. Those on trial for the insurrection aren't the only ones whose lives changed due to COVID. Everyone's world took a turn on January 6th, especially Americans. The buildup stemmed from a presidential election overshadowed by COVID, one where the concepts of fake news and media dishonesty started to peak. Trump called out the media at his rally. The morning protesters stormed the Capitol. You heard Marjorie Taylor Greene's displeasure earlier. Many covering the presidential race, its candidates, and the riots have been subject to mass criticism from several political leaders. This comes despite the fact that most journalists were reporting from home, but stories from the insurrection were at the forefront of the news the day after, and in many cases, they still are three years later. January 6th, 2021, was one of many long-term impacts felt by journalists in the wake of the pandemic.